Okay, I trust everyone knows that's tongue-in-cheek, sarcasm. Uh, And if here this week I get a long list of names for many of you, then uh, I'm just going to give them to Mr. Fogo. So, okay, just so you know. All right, uh, we'll, get, we'll get into that, debunking that, and seeing what the Scripture actually teaches here in just a moment. However, there's one thing that I want to do before I dive into all of that. Um, when I use the phrase, above and beyond, for some of you, that's going to you know, click, it's going to bring back memories, Um, Above and Beyond Campaign was something that we initiated back in the fall of 2012. It was a three-year capital campaign that was going to be used. It was above and beyond regular giving, and and a good portion, most of the church, uh, people that made up the church participated in it. And uh, it was going to be used for three primary things. One was expanding the parking lot and two... Uh, the monument sign, building that, because we'd gone all those years without a monument sign out there. And, and then the third thing, which was, we knew was going to end up being the greater part of it all, uh, was going to be having money to pay directly onto the principal of our loan uh, that the church had or has. And uh, um, so anyway, that's what we set out on, a three-year commitment in uh, the fall of 2012. And uh, after that three years was done, there was a percentage of people that continued to give. As a matter of fact, um, some even continued to give through 2019. You do the math on that, how many years that ended up being. Uh, But we are closing the books on Above and Beyond as of the very end of December of 2019. And I thought I would share just a couple of quick things with you here today because just this week, we cut the very last check uh, that we were paying funds from above and beyond that we were paying on to the principal of the mortgage. In fact, this week, it was a check of $109,563 that had been given here in the church. Um, that we, we were able to apply on to the principal. And so that makes for a grand total uh, from the time we started above and beyond uh, $1,273,000 and some change that has been given over these years uh, above and beyond regular giving uh, that's been applied to those three areas, including almost $830,000 of that amount uh, that was applied onto the principal of the church's mortgage. And so I just wanted to share that with you because, you know, we've tried to update from time to time. This is your very final update in regards to above and beyond. Uh, but I want to say it in the very same breath. Uh, I want to say thank you on, on my own personal behalf, but on behalf of the leadership of the church, I want to thank you for your generosity uh, that... Uh, uh, so many of you have expressed over over this extended time in in being so generous in giving. Uh, one of the reasons that Crossroads Christian Church is able to be you know a strong and stable church, you know in in certain regards, especially in finances and some of that, uh, is because of the generosity of the people that call this church their own. And so thank you for your generosity over the the last several years. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to jump into the message and show you how off that video really was. And we're going to we're going to jump right into a verse we're just immediately, kind of like last week. We're immediately jumping into a verse, and you're going to see this verse at least five times um, through the message today. It is on your outline. It is the memory verse for today's message. It's Second Timothy chapter two, verse two. So it's fairly easy to remember the reference because you just think all twos. Second Timothy, Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. This is the second one. It's chapter two. It's verse two. And here's what he said. The things you have heard me say 
in the presence of many witnesses, in trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, there's an important principle that is found in his words uh, of this verse, and it's a pretty unique verse all in all. In fact, a very unique verse, because whether you recognize it at first glance or not, there are four generations represented in that one verse. And I'm not necessarily talking about biological uh, generations. I'm talking about spiritual uh, generations primarily, but it could include and should include um, biological as well. But look at it again. Paul is the one that is writing this. He says, the things you have heard me say. Okay, so Paul is generation number one, and the you represents Timothy, who he's writing to, and that's generation two. The things you have heard from me, basically. Um, in trust to reliable people, there's generation number three, who will also be qualified to teach others. There's generation four. So like I said, this is a unique verse in that it's, it's including four generations of believers. But before you can really appreciate what is being communicated here, you've got to answer the question, what is he talking about? What is the things up in that top, the second word in the verse? The things you have heard me say. I mean, that's pretty ambiguous, right? Things, that could, that could refer to anything under the sun. Well, Paul's thinking very specifically here. And if you were with us last Sunday, you, you know what the things includes. In fact, what is at the very heart and what dominates the things. This was our key verse last Sunday. Even though he's writing it to a different church, Still, Paul is giving us insight into what matters most. He said this, For I determined to know nothing while among you, I, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Now, it's not that that's the only thing that Paul ever talked about because there were some other things that he brought up, but this was the dominant thing. This was central to all of his teaching. And so when we back that up to the previous verse that we just looked at, the things you have heard me say, well, that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. I mean, that is the biggest portion of what the things consist of. All right, so that, that's what he's talking about. Um, Peter and John, they uh, said some stuff uh, that would fall right into that same category. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I mean, th this is what these things are. It was all centered ultimately on Jesus Christ and what Jesus accomplished when he went to the cross. Okay, so that's what Paul was passing on to Timothy. And he said, what you've heard, pass on, Timothy, to reliable men, who then will be able to teach others. Okay, four generations represented. Now, sometimes we can appreciate a concept better when we see an example of it. Let me give you an example. It's found in, in this is one example, in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, I'm just going to summarize it primarily for you. Um, it has the distinction of being in a, chap a chapter that is uh, entirely devoted to telling three stories. They're, they're basically miracles that had happened. The first one is a demoniac, a guy that was possessed by a host of demons. The second one is a woman who had been suffering from bleeding for, for many, many years, and she had seen every doctor she could possibly go to, spent every dime of her money, and she wasn't any better. She was worse. And then the third one was a very sickly child that ended up dying. So all three of these examples of miracles that end up taking place in Mark chapter 5 uh, you could easily see and say that they are extreme cases. 
situations. Well, this first one involved this guy who was in the Gadarenes region, which is basically the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, kind of southeastern side, actually. And he was possessed by a bunch of demons. And people in that area, they tried to do what they could to help him uh, because things were kind of getting out of control. This guy was doing some some crazy things, and it was scary to everyone that lived in the vicinity. I mean, basically, you know, he went an extended period of time where he wasn't wearing any clothes at all. He was screaming and yelling. He lived out among the tombs, and he was taking sharp stones, and he was cutting himself with it. Now, remember, he wasn't under his own control. He was possessed. And the people that tried to help him uh, in, uh, with any method that they could possibly think of, and one of the extreme methods was they even took chains and they chained him so that he wouldn't harm himself. But he was able, under the possession, to break free of those chains. And so eventually, people in that area had kind of given up hope that they could do anything to help him. And so basically, the understanding in the community was stay away from the tombs in that area where he's at. Just avoid it, if at all possible. Well, along comes Jesus and his disciples in a boat, and they, they uh, push uh, upon the shore there in that eastern, southeastern part of the Sea of Galilee, and they get out, and they're, they're walking out there, and they're entering in right into the Gadarenes area, and... Uh, um, this demonized man, you know, sees Jesus, Jesus sees him and immediately can draw some conclusions of what the situation is. And Jesus commands that the demons leave. Well, the guy comes running up to him, falls to his knees and begins, you know, asking questions like, son of God, why are you here? What are your plans? And stuff like this. Jesus asks him what his name is. And the response is legion. Now, if you think of a Roman legion, you're thinking about a, a ton of soldiers, right, that were a part of a legion. And so he says legion, be, and, and the answer in its fullness is legion, for we are many. And it's at that time Jesus sees this uh, herd of pigs nearby, a large herd, and he casts the demons out of this man, and they enter into the pigs. And if you didn't remember any of the story, you will remember this part. Um, this whole herd of pigs, they rush over the embankment, it's a bluff, and they fall into the Sea of Galilee and they all drown. Now, that would have been quite a spectacle because there were 2,000 pigs in this herd of pigs. And, and now, all of a sudden, this guy who had been possessed for who knows how long, um, now he's in his right mind for the first time. And uh, next snapshot picture we have of him is he is dressed and he is sitting there among Jesus and his disciples. Now people from the local community, they catch word about what had just happened and they're making their way out there to check this out. And you can just imagine as they're glancing into the sea and they're seeing all these pig bodies floating around like bobbers out there in the water, you know, and some of them up on the shore and all. And then they see the guy that notoriously had caused them to avoid this whole area, but yet he was sitting there in his right mind, his whole expression and everything is different. Now, they don't understand how is that possible. But, you know, somewhere along the line, they learn that it's due to Jesus. But since they don't have an understanding of how this person was capable of doing this, you know, sometimes what we don't know can cause, can stir up fear within us. And it was stirring up fear within them. And they started commanding that Jesus and his disciples just get out of there, get back in their boat and leave. And Jesus isn't going to stay anywhere where he's not wanted. He's not going to force himself upon people. So indeed, Jesus and the disciples, they make their way to the boat and they climb into the boat. But they're not the only ones trying to climb into the boat. You could probably guess who the other person is. It was the guy that had been demon-possessed. I mean, Jesus had done something for him that nobody else had ever been able to do. And he didn't want to allow Jesus to get out of his sight. He wanted to be with Jesus. But I want you to see what Jesus said to him. 
It's in verse 19. Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So here this guy has the intention. He wants to continue to be around Jesus. He wants to climb into the boat, not knowing where Jesus was going. It didn't matter to him. He just wanted to be with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, no. You go home to your family and you tell them everything the Lord has done for you. The very next verse, we read this. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region. That's called the Decapolis. Um, it, it, was, it was a fairly small region, and there were 10 villages in that area. And, uh, and that's where he went, to those 10 towns. And he began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. So Jesus had given him instructions. Nope, you're not getting into the boat. Go back to your home and tell your family, tell your relatives. And apparently this guy in that area had relatives that were in more than one location. They were spread out in these towns. And so he just started going from town to town. And he was telling the news of what they had done for him. There's something that we can clearly see in that story, um, but also as a part of our main verse here today that I want us to clearly see today. And it's not just a fringe, tiny detail as far as our faith is concerned. This is a core component of our faith. Remember, this series of messages, eight-part series, um, seeing clearly in 2020. And what we're dealing with are eight um, different core components of our faith and, uh, and how we need to be careful that uh, we understand, you know, what it is the Bible is teaching on this. And so let me start it off by saying this. As a believer... This is what we need to know. You are a part of God's redemptive strategy. You are part of God's salvation plan. You're part of it. And and that's the thing that we're seeing here, whether it be in 2 Timothy 2, 2, or you're looking at Mark chapter 5 and you're seeing this previous demoniac guy and the instructions that Jesus gave him. Now, let me qualify that or explain that a little bit because the reality is that you don't have the power in and of yourself to save anyone. It needs to be understood. You do not have the wherewithal to save yourself let alone save anyone else, no matter how badly you might want to do that. But what you do have is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. As a believer, that is what you do have. And that's no small thing. In fact, that is a matter of first importance. That's the way Paul described it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. The gospel is a matter of first importance importance. It's not a secondary sort of thing. And you've got that message if you're a believer. And I've got that message. And I like the way Paul spoke of it in the beginning of his letter to the church in Rome. Romans 1.16, he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This applies to Jewish people but it also applies to non-Jewish people. Okay, well, that pretty much covers all of us. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it, not ashamed of the gospel. What is this gospel? This gospel is that God so loved the world that he sent his son into this world to do something that was uh, uh, amazing, incredible, And that was to offer himself, after having lived a perfect life, he offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice. He voluntarily allowed himself to be taken and to be crucified, though he could have stopped the proceedings of that at any moment that he wanted to, but he knew he needed to do that in order to accomplish what his mission was for coming into the world. And that was to die on the cross, so as to be the one who could pay the penalty for your sin making it possible for you and for myself to be forgiven of our sin and to have a home in heaven in the presence of a holy God reserved for us. Though we, by our own right, by our own doing, did not qualify to be holy. But that's where Jesus stepped in, and he did that for us. And by the grace of God, we appropriate that holiness. 
That is what the gospel message is. And that's what Paul is saying. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to whoever believes. It is a matter of first importance. And here's the thing about that. Before someone can receive that, before someone can embrace that, before someone can can have that, they need to hear the message. They need to hear it. And that's where you and I come into play. Later in Romans, Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's a statement that you know, should cause... You and I both, if we spend any time at all reading this book, that should cause us to nod our heads, if not say amen, and be in agreement with that. Because that's clearly the teaching of Scripture. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And perhaps that's even a verse that you've memorized at at one particular point in time. It's a good verse. But sometimes when we center in too much on one verse, we kind of... Um, forget to look at what's right next to it in Scripture. And what I want you to see is what Paul said immediately following this because right after he makes this declarative true statement that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, then he kind of gives us a little lesson in logic, right? This is what verse 14 says. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have not heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Ah, and this is where it comes back to us. This is where you and I come into it all. You know, the, the amazing thing about this, when you think about um, the, and how God has chosen to spread the message, the good news of this gospel. Uh, The amazing thing about it is that God had at his disposal any of a variety of ways of getting that message out. I mean, God is God, right? So, I mean, you can't put limitations upon God. And so God had at his disposal, you know, any number of ways. For example, God could have decided uh, way back when before he even created Adam and Eve. God could have decided that every full moon, the gospel would be broadcast on the face of the moon. He could have used that like a chalkboard, and he could have written a message for us to see and hear about the importance of looking to him and the Savior that was to come. And then when Jesus came, the Savior that came. God could have chosen to do that so that every month, whatever part of the world you're in, when you would see the full moon there for two or three days or whatever, you'd be able to see the message of the gospel. God could have chosen that method of broadcasting that all-important message. But instead, God didn't decide to do that. Instead, he left it so that when you and I look at a full moon, we see craters. Okay, it was like, nope, not going to put the gospel message there. All right, well, God, another thing God could have done is he could have given the message to birds that talked. And birds could give us that, right? I mean, there is such a thing, right? Parrots, any of you ever owned a parrot? Any of you ever heard a parrot (laughs) talk and use words? Yeah, yeah, they can. I mean, if nothing else, you've seen it on TV, You know, and yeah, they're mimicking, you know, what they've heard others to say and all. But what's to say that God couldn't have pre-programmed parrots or some other kind of bird to share the gospel message of his love for us and the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ? He, He could have given it and delivered it in that fashion through birds. But he chose not to. 
For that matter, God could have uh, done something uh, that would have been kind of cool, um, as though those things wouldn't have been cool. He could, he could have, he could, you know how when you, you get a fortune cookie, you crack the fortune cookie open, and uh, inside the fortune cookie there's this little slip of paper, and you pull it out, and, you know, it says stuff like, um, with, within the very next week, your favorite team is going to win a huge victory. Okay, you know, some kind of a little message like that, you know, and, and uh, you know, so people kind of get a kick out of fortune cookies. Well, you know what God could have done? God could have had little notes like that, but he could have uh, had them develop within walnuts. So every time someone cracks a walnut and opens it up, there's a message that references the gospel. Any of you ever cracked walnuts before? I mean, walnuts didn't originate in a plastic bag on a store shelf, okay? So, you know, so, someone somehow <laughs> went through the work of breaking it open. And I remember as kids, this, this was one of the few times, even when we were real young, that dad would put a hammer in each of our hands. And, uh, you know, I think he probably had a sit apart a ways. But, uh, but you know, breaking these walnuts and, and pulling the meat of the walnut out, well, there could have been this little message of the gospel. Yeah, God had at his disposal those and many other possibilities of delivering the message, but instead he chose you. Just sit on that for a moment. Instead of doing any of those kinds of things, he chose you and he chose me. You see, this is part of where the Great Commission comes into play. You know, passages like Matthew 28 where Jesus said, uh, before he ascended back into heaven, he said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to do and observe all that I've commanded you, and I will be with you always. Um, yeah, that's part of the whole idea here. It's more than just living a nice life and doing good deeds. Living a nice life and doing good deeds is biblical. You and I, we ought to be known for our good deeds. I could show you various scriptures that teach that, that we should be known for our good deeds. But we got to be careful to carry this thought too far because some have carried it so far that little expressions like this have become well known. St. Francis is credited as saying, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. You, you know what's being implied there. Let your actions speak for themselves. But if you need to, you know, you might say a word now and then. All right, now I've got a couple problems with that. Now, I know you maybe have seen that before in books, or maybe it's been on Facebook and you've seen it there. Um, perhaps somebody embroidered it and it's framed and it's on the wall in your house. But I, I hate to break it to you, but I got a problem with it. First of all, St. Francis didn't say that. <laughs> There's no evidence that he said that, okay? So uh, where that connection came, uh, I don't know. The second problem I had with it, have with it, is that that's terrible theology. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. Not that the Bible doesn't say and encourage us to live good lives and good deeds and all of this kind of stuff. But, you know, if that's what you do, if that's just what you do is, is be a nice person and do good things, and it doesn't go beyond that, what are people who are watching going to conclude? You're a nice person, period. That's what they're going to conclude. They're not going to understand the motivation behind why you live the kind of life that you live, it needs to be coupled with words. And, and by living a good life and the good deeds and all this, that helps add credibility to the words that you're sharing. But there's got to be words that are a part of this. And again, that brings us back to our original verse, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. It says, the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... And trust reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. You see, it's talking about speech here. It's talking about a message that you're verbally sharing with someone else. 
And, and, and here, you know, I think is an accurate statement that some, sometimes things that can be so obvious are so obvious we overlook them. This should begin right under your nose. This, this whole principle of what it is that we're talking about here today. Does this need to happen um, overseas where missionaries are? Absolutely, no doubt about it. Does this need to happen uh, in the midst of your peer group as far as your coworkers or your circle of friends? Absolutely. But if you have a family, this is where it starts. It doesn't leave out this other stuff, but this is certainly where it starts. It's right underneath your nose. Remember what Jesus told the guy who had previously um, been possessed by the demons? He said, no, get out of my boat. I mean, that's what's implied there. No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you. Go to your family. You've got something to share now. Go and share it. There are multiple passages that reinforce that. Let me just for a moment just stay in the Old Testament because I want you to understand that this kind of approach to things is something that isn't something new that just pops up in the New Testament in the writings of Paul, but rather you can go back in the Old Testament and you will see that this is kind of the way God has operated in the past. For example, Psalm 78, there are two verses in particular that... that really drive this thought home. It says this, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. I don't know if you've added it up, but there's three or four generations right there in those two verses. You see, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 isn't the only place where you find something like that. You find it here. Now, in this passage, it's primarily thinking more along the lines of the biological generations, but it's still the very same principle that is being spoken of. Look at this one in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the chapter that immediately follows where the Ten Commandments are listed in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Through Moses, this is the message. These words that I'm giving you today are to be on your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. You see, this is something that, that you know, the, the, all these commands, Moses is talking to a different generation than those that had crossed over um, the Red Sea, okay, because that whole generation had died off. Now this is the the kids that have all grown up. They're the next generation. And he's saying these things, and he lists out the Ten Commandments among these others, and, and he says this is the kind of stuff you need to be telling your kids. You need to make it a part, not just of the religious stuff in the religious building one day of the week, which for them would have been the tabernacle, but uh, uh, this needs to be a part of everyday life that you're talking about. Whether you're engaged in something with your hands, whether you're walking, whether you're lying down, that's beside the point. This ought to be a regular part of, of your daily life that you are intentionally passing them on to your children, not keeping them to yourselves. And here, one more. Psalm 71, verses 17 and 18 says, God... You have taught me from my youth, and I still proclaim your wonderful works. For even when I am old and gray, okay, we got to admit there's a few of us in here that that's describing right now, okay? Um, even when I am old and gray, God, do not abandon me. Then I will proclaim your power to another generation, your strength to all who are to come. You see, it's the same principle, passing it on, serving as a link in the chain as we take the good news that we're hearing and we're passing it on and making sure the next generation hears it as well. Our children, our grandchildren, it's not limited to them by any means, but that's where it begins. 
As a matter of fact, there was a fellow by the name of Dr. Benjamin Bloom. Uh, quite a few years ago, he uh, um, worked at the University of Chicago. His research demonstrated some, at the time, some groundbreaking, eye-opening results as far as young children are concerned. As a matter of fact, his research was instrumental in helping to start the Head Start program for uh, low-income families. I mean, they, they really used his um, conclusions from a number of his, his surveys and tests and all that he had done. But, but here, here's the crux of what Dr. Bloom came up with. 50% of a child's intelligence is developed by the time they're four years old. 50%. Now, if you're a parent or a grandparent and you've got a child that is in that age bracket, that probably isn't terribly surprising. I mean, it, my memory's being refreshed because my grandson, Bo, he's like uh, uh, two years and four months old now. And it, it is incredible. We see him twice a week. And it is incredible that his learning has accelerated so much in the last six months. I mean, it's just, every time he comes over, it's just like, Man, he's using terminology that I hadn't heard. He's actually using figures of speech. It's just like, come on, kid, you're only two. How do you even know how to use that phrase? And, and uh, I mean, he is learning so much, but that's part of what Dr. Bloom was discovering is that 50% of a child's intelligence is developed by age four. And he went on to say this, another 30% by the age of eight. So that means, Mark, you know, your smarts, you pretty much had 80% of it when you were eight years old. You haven't made a whole lot of progress since. So, uh, <laughs> you, but I mean, you think about that, you know, and that helps us. That helps us to understand the importance of children's ministry. That helps us to understand why that is something worth investing in because it really does make a difference in that critical period of time in a person's life, whether it be a ministry that is a part of the church programming or whether it's something that is happening in your home, the time that you invest in teaching and nurturing the faith in your children. We call those years the formative years for a reason. It's not just talking about physical development there. It's talking about a whole lot more that is developing and growing. And, and so this, this is where this whole concept of what it is that we're talking about today, it's not limited in a biological way to children and grandchildren, but that's where it begins, right underneath our nose. And it goes beyond that. Again, back to the verse, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. The bottom line of what passages like this are communicating is that we are not to keep it to ourselves. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of what he did when he went to the cross on our behalf and when he rose again on the third day, and the impact that that can make when you embrace that, the transforming power that his spirit can have in, in your life, that is not something you're to keep to yourself. And that, that is part of why Jesus said what he did to the demoniac that tried crawling into the boat. He was saying, no, no, you've got a message. You need to go deliver that message. And, and briefly, here are some other passages to show you the New Testament is basically communicating this similar principle as what the Old Testament is. And I'm not going to go to the obvious examples of the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16 or Matthew chapter 28. Let me use a couple other ones you may not be quite as familiar with, like Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, as Jesus walked along the, the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, we know him better as Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. And this is what Jesus said to him. Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. 
You know, Jesus wasn't saying, hey, come follow me, and I'm going to share something that's going to blow your mind. You know, that's not what he said. Though what he was going to share was going to do that. But he was saying, come follow me, and I'll use you to blow the mind of others. You know, you'll be, you'll be looking for people to share this with. Here's another one, Luke chapter 10. Jesus ended up having more disciples in the days and years that followed. And Luke 10 refers to some of those. It says, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So here he is sending, sending other disciples out in pairs, like, what is that, 35, 30, 36 pairs, sending them out, you know, because uh, they've got a message to share as well, to kind of prep the way, because Jesus was going to be following, okay? All right, well, let's get out of the first century. You know, a number of years later, Paul said this, but this principle applies not just to the church in Corinth, but even to the church here in the 21st century. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said this, For God was in Christ, restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. This is the wonderful message he has given to us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is using us to speak to you. We beg you as though Christ himself were pleading with you, receive the love he offers you. Be reconciled to God. You see, the Lord wants us to share the news. He doesn't want us sitting on it. He doesn't want us to keep it to ourselves. As a believer, I am sure you have a testimony. Whether you had embraced Christ, received him into your life 50 years ago, or whether it was sometime in the last year, the reality of the matter is you have a testimony. You have a story to tell about how the Lord not only saved you and forgave you of your sin, but has actually changed you into being a better person. You have a story, so tell it. Share it. See, that's what Jesus was getting at with the demoniac. And that's what Paul was getting at in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. To share the message. So one last time. This is what Paul said. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Four generations. And basically what he was telling Timothy, he's telling us, you are a link in the chain. Don't be a broken link. Okay? Don't let the chain stop with you. You're a link in the chain. Someone at some point in time had shared the good news of Jesus with you. They had explained things to you to some degree, and you maybe came upon some of it from your own study and all, but there was someone who was coaching and influencing you early on, and that helped you in making that all-important decision. And what this passage is saying is, okay, Someone did that. They passed it on to you. Don't sit on it. You can be that kind of a blessing to someone else. So share it with someone else. So they then, in turn, can share it with someone else. Don't be a broken link in this chain. So I ask this. Who has God placed in your life right now that you can be sharing with? I'm a firm believer that we um, are not just by accident where we are. The place that you work, the neighborhood you live in, um, the groups that you might be a part of, and that cross, you cross paths and rub shoulders with certain people, I am a firm believer that stuff like this doesn't just happen by accident, and this is called the providence of God. God kind of rules over everything, even what we would consider circumstances in our life. So again, I ask the question, who has God placed in your life that you can be influencing right now? I mean, it might be that elderly neighbor that moved in that you just heard is having some health struggles. 
that might be the very person, you know, that you can make contact with. And they, they might very much so need to hear this message. It might be that new coworker. You know, it might be that new brother-in-law that you just got that married into the family. But you've kind of discovered, okay, they don't have much for spiritual roots. And, and now you can do something here. You can plant some seeds. You can nurture that in their life. You see, deep down inside, we all want to make a difference in our lives. Especially, we want to make a difference that is impactful beyond our years here on earth, the 70 or 80 years that we end up living here on earth. We want to make a difference that outlives us. And I can't think of any better example to that than the very thing that we're talking about here today. I can't think of any more critical example of that than the very thing that we're talking about here today. Our ushers are going to be getting up and preparing for our time of communion. And while they're doing that, I I want to challenge you with this thought. The next time you find yourself in front of a mirror, I want you just to take in a deep breath so that you can take a good long look at what you're seeing in the mirror. That can be kind of scary, okay? But uh, do that. Just take a good long look at what you're seeing in the mirror, what's looking back at you. And understand this, that what you're seeing, that is God's strategy of getting the message of Jesus out to the world. That's what you're looking at. God's got his eye on you as a believer, and he's got his eye on me. We are part of the plan of redemption. Not that our blood or any kind of a sacrifice we make can save people, but we are part of, call it the delivery mechanism of getting the message out there, that all-important message. You and I, we get the special privilege of being a part of that process. And how cool is that? Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for your love. And forgive us for the times that we take it for granted and we kind of fall into this mode of ritual and religion and and just kind of going through the motions. Father, today we kind of take a step back from any of those kind of tendencies And we have allowed your spirit to refresh our memory. That you love us. You love us so incredibly much that you sent your son Jesus to come and do something so unthinkable as to go to the cross voluntarily and to die on our behalf. So as to make a way possible for us to have access into the presence of a holy God. Something that based on our own merit, we had been disqualified for. But because of Jesus and that incredible sacrifice, we now have the hope of eternity lying before us. We celebrate that, Lord. We are so thankful for that. And while we take the bread today and we eat it in the cup and we drink it, we're reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus and and, and that amazing sacrifice made possible totally by the love and the grace that comes from you, Lord. Lord, I also pray that it's during this time that through your spirit you would stir within our minds and our hearts both in bringing conviction of understanding, but also in bringing to mind the face or faces of certain individuals that you have put in our path for the purpose of being a link in the chain, of sharing the all-important message so more people 
can hear the good news and more people can rejoice and celebrate the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you might find us faithful. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.